a reading from the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verses 1 to 12. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out His commands. In fact, this is love for God, to keep His commands, and His commands are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that, we, that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and the three are in agreement. We accept human testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which He has given about His Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts this testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made Him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony God has given about His Son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that reading. I expressed in the, the interview that John did with me that um, I, I became a Christian in my late teens. Uh, but the week after I got saved, something quite interesting happened. Uh, and that was that I began to have doubts about my faith. Um, I, am I really a Christian? Ha, have all those things that I've done in the past been forgiven? Uh, why am I still struggling with some of my bad habits, etc., etc.? And I was honored to discover that um, having doubts is not unusual for Christians, but I had them, uh, and those doubts went on for uh, quite some time. Uh, I also had a friend in, in my church, actually a, an older person in the church, because he was my Bible class leader, and he was a, a, an engineer or an engineering professor, quite a brilliant man, who, who worked in one of the major universities in, in Northern Ireland uh, as a professor of engineering. But I could never figure out why he was a teacher because he was absolutely rank rotten at making things simple. Um, in, in fact, if you give him a very uh, uh, ordinary proposition, like how do you park a car, or how do you add two plus two plus two, and he'd go around his explanation in such a contorted way, you're utterly confused, and you think, how can somebody make something so simple into something so complex? Now, why am I telling you those two things? Well, first of all, uh, because the people that John is writing to, some of them have begun to doubt at the time when he's writing this letter. So, so doubt is quite a big issue in their lives. Uh, and secondly, John himself, unlike the great Apostle Paul, um, seemed to be quite a complex individual. Now, I'm sure he's a lovely guy, but his explanation of almost everything seemed to be massively complex. And you come to passages like this and you think, what on earth is John on about here? Because he expresses himself in such a convoluted, complex way. And yet, what he says is brilliant. It's really brilliant. And it's worth that persevering with. And what I intend to do is just to go through this passage again. And please keep the, uh, the verses up on the screen. Because I want us to really think through the implications of what John is saying to us. Take, for example, um, uh, the first three verses. See, what John is trying to do here is, is to kind of suss us all out. He wants to ultimately assure us that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, 
your salvation is absolutely rock solid. But before he gets there, he wants to make sure that you really are genuinely trusting in Jesus. And that's what the first three verses are about. Uh, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. And if we love God's children, we will love God and obey his commands. Loving God means keeping his commands, for his commands are not burdensome. Now, quite a, a, a collection of thoughts thrown on, but he's really just saying three things here. Quite simply, once you unpack them. Uh, he's, he's really asked the question, what is a genuine Christian? What is somebody who really believes in Jesus, who's really part of God's family? Well, three things. Number one, they believe that Jesus is the Christ. Now, notice the, the form of words, the Christ. The word Christ wasn't kind of Jesus' surname. I was asked that one time by a kid in the youth club. Uh, was, was Christ Jesus' second name? or his family name. No, it wasn't. But it was a really important uh, Jewish word or Jewish idea. It was just, uh, it just meant the anointed. Uh, And uh, what the title the Christ meant was this, that God had anointed Jesus to be be the savior of the world. Uh, On an important occasion when somebody, for example, is is being made king or elevated to, to the position of being king, they would anoint that person to signify he's the guy. Now, God did that with Jesus. In the birth narratives in the Gospels, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Jesus was the anointed one, the Christ, the person that God decided would be the savior of the world. Now, uh, if you really believe that, that there's only one way to heaven, There's only one person to believe in. Uh, There's only one unique savior, and that is Jesus Christ. That's a sure sign you're a Christian. No other way, only through Jesus. So that's number one. If you believe exclusively in salvation by Jesus alone. Secondly, that belief also needs to impact uh, your lives. John goes on to say, if we are God's children and we see him as our father, then we will also love God's other children. Now, you've heard the expression sibling rivalry. That, by the way, happens in the Christian church. Um, lots of Christians do struggle at times to get on with each other. It's unfortunate, but, but, but they do. Nevertheless, There's a recognition that uh, God is our father, and so therefore I will love everybody who claims to be a child of God, who who genuinely follows Jesus. But that's his second litmus test. Uh, You first of all believe that Christ is the only way of salvation. You secondly love all of God's family. Uh, And then thirdly, we obey God's command. You see, anybody can call themselves a Christian. But a true Christian is somebody who says, I'm going to believe and obey God. Whatever God says, I will do. So those are three litmus tests that John gives us. Christ is the only way of salvation. We love all believers because we're all part of God's family and we're going to obey God. Now, if those three things are true of you, then you're a Christian. And it doesn't matter uh, what struggles you have, and you will have struggles as a Christian, but if those three things are true, you are a believer, you are a child of God. And then look at the next section, verses four and five. For every child of God defeats the evil uh, world, and, and we achieve this victory through our faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Now again, a complex collection of verses. Uh, but what John is reminding us is this that if you are a true Christian, uh, we we still live in a fallen world. And that's not an easy place to be. Uh, Because it means that the values that we take on as Christians, because we are following God, we're obeying God, the values that we take on are are, are not the same as the values the world round about us. And and what does that mean? Uh, Well, it often means that we're at odds with our culture. It, It often means that people will dislike you, put you down, name call, 
because they don't like what you represent and so they'll be opposed to you. It also means that the devil himself, who is God's arch enemy, will try to attack you and tempt you and oppose you. So obeying God, following Christ, living for him does mean opposition. But John isn't just warning us that those tough times will come. He's actually giving us some good news in all of this. Because he says, if you recognize that you're in a battle, and if you stand by your faith because you really do believe in it, and you know that Christ is the only way, so he's worth fighting for, and so you'll stand by him even in the midst of opposition, that itself is evidence that you are a Christian. And when you win those victories and you stand firm despite all your struggles, that's evidence that you really are God's child because you're living this victory life even though you're still living in this world that's um, so fallen and so broken and, uh, and so uh, morally bankrupt. So if, if, if right now you're going through a tough time as a Christian uh, and you're just keeping going even though it's tough, Actually, you should be pleased about that. It's evidence that you really are God's child. So rejoice in that. That's what John wants you to do. And then look at uh, verses uh, 6 and 7. Uh, if, if, if the rest was complex, this gets even more complex. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross, not by water only, but by water and blood, and the Spirit whose truth confirms it with his testimony. So we have three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Now, what on earth does that all mean? Actually, it's, it's intriguing. I mean, John's mindset here, he thinks like nobody else on earth thinks. He starts off by... Um, talking about two events in the life of Jesus. His baptism and his death. Now, here's the significance of those two events. Um, they are bookends. Jesus' baptism was the start of his ministry. His death was the end of his ministry. Now, what happened in his baptism? Well, if you go to Matthew 3, don't, don't look it up just now, but maybe you can look it up at home. Uh, in Matthew 3, we have a description of the baptism of Jesus. And when he went down into the water to be baptized by John the Baptist, an incredible thing happened. The Holy Spirit appeared. And they heard an audible voice from God saying, This is my son. I'm pleased with him. That wasn't any kind of usual occurrence. That, that was amazing. And John is saying, think of how incredible that was. Here's somebody who gets baptized and the Holy Spirit himself comes and presides and speaks at the baptism. It's amazing. Uh, and then you have the end of Jesus' ministry, his death. Uh, John 19, verse 30, a, a, a verse you quoted earlier on where Jesus said, it is finished. Well, what was finished? J Jesus worked to save us from our sins, to die and take the punishment for our sins. And he knew at that given point that the job was done and all that was needed to be done to save us from our sins was done. And so with confidence, even though he was weak and, uh, and emaciated uh, and, and he had suffered from blood loss and, and hours of agony, he still cried with a loud voice, it is finished. Uh, and John said that from that beginning, the baptism, all the way to his death when Jesus said, it is finished, that whole time, the Holy Spirit was working in Jesus' ministry. Uh, and of course, what happens next? God raises Jesus from the dead. Even further proof. Uh, and the point I'm making here is that um, you've got three things aligned. Number one, Jesus uh, taking that step of obedience to God by being baptized. Number two, 
him taking that step of obedience to God by dying on the cross for our sins. And number three, the Holy Spirit putting God's stamp of authority, his imprimatur on all of this to say, this is my will. Now John says, look, look at those three things. That's incredibly impressive. How can you doubt that Jesus really is God's answer to the world's problems when those three things all align? And then he follows it up, up by verses seven and eight, where he talks about three witnesses, the spirit, the water, and the blood. He's actually uh, continuing a kind of a Jewish legal argument. You remember John's from a Jewish background. Now here's how uh, Jewish, Jewish uh, jurisprudence goes. If you're a lawyer in a court and you're bringing witnesses about a, a particular crime, if you've only got one witness, you might possibly get a conviction but it's a bit of a shiggly peg. Uh, you're not quite sure this thing's gonna go through. If you have two witnesses, well, that's much more confident. And in Jewish law, the, the, the witness of two people has to be taken uh, as, as, as solid evidence. If you get three, it's an open and shut case. Three witnesses and you can convict anybody. That's how Jewish law worked. They did it by numbers. The Jews are always good at their numbers. At three people, you've got an open and shut case. That's the point that, that John is making here. You've got um, the first witness, the baptism, confirming who Jesus is. The second witness, his death on the cross. It is finished. Jesus' own statement about the success of his ministry. And number three, the spirit himself, who presided over all of this and said, that's dead right. The job is done. You can be certain of your salvation. That, that's the argument that, uh, that, that John is making here. Uh, and just in case some folk might scratch their heads and say, well, um, I need to think about that for a moment. Look at what happens next. Verse 9. Since we believe human testimony, surely we can believe the greater testimony that comes from God. Now notice he's keeping the same legal argument going. And he's really hammering home his point. And God has testified this about his son. All who believe in the son of God know in their hearts that this testimony is true. Those who don't believe this are actually calling God a liar because they don't believe what God has testified about his son. Now, I've, I've, I've been on a jury, so I've sat through uh, legal cases. I've also been a witness, as has my wife, in different cases. And uh, we know from general life that we take human testimony seriously. People have been sent down for life imprisonment based on human testimony. And John is saying that's quite right. If, if, if somebody give a, gives an eyewitness testimony, that, that should be sufficient grounds to, to um, have a conviction. But this is God's testimony. God is saying this. So if you're going to sit there and begin to doubt the efficacy of what's taken place here. Jesus saying it is finished, the Holy Spirit confirming that. If you're gonna doubt that, if you don't think that's a, that's a firm enough case to rest your salvation on, then in effect, what you're saying is that God's a liar. Now, and you might be saying, well, hang on a second. I, I never said that. You're putting words in my mouth. I, I'm not saying that God's a liar. All I'm saying is, uh, you know, I've looked into this Christianity business and I, I, I'm not all that sure about it. I, I, I know Jesus existed. I know he died on the cross. I know all of that. I, I'm just not certain that that's enough to go on to rest my whole eternal future on. Well, you might not be certain, but God clearly is. And that's the point that John is making. God is certain. He sent his own spirit, not only at the baptism, but right the way throughout the life of Jesus, he was there at the death of Christ when Christ said it is finished. And then he raised Christ from the dead as further proof of everything that was, that, that was taking place here. God is saying to us, I'm telling you, I am telling you that this is something you can be certain of. This is a rock solid case. And if you deny that, if you question that, then in effect, you are calling God a liar. That's a really serious position to be in. John is raising the stakes here. And for good reason. 
We are dealing with your and my eternal destination. Uh, I've thought a great deal about um, the fragility of life this past week because I buried my wife's aunt in South Wales just three days ago. She lived to 92. She's apparently healthy. We were with her the week before she died and then suddenly, like that, she's gone. What's next? Now, she happens to be a Christian, so we have no concerns whatsoever. In fact, I was saying at the funeral, we're rejoicing. She was old and frail and in a nursing home where she didn't particularly want to be. And now she's in glory. That is brilliant news. And I asked all the folk at the funeral to rejoice and to celebrate and to be glad because we ought to be. It's good news. A lot's at stake here. An awful lot at stake. And that's why we must trust God's word. God is telling us, if you trust the Son, you'll have life. If you don't, you miss out. Now take God for granted. T- take God's word. Believe in it. Don't deny it. Don't make God out to be a liar. Trust it. Uh, and look at how uh, John finishes off his argument. Verses 11 and 12. And this is what God has testified. He has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. Those are very, very powerful statements. Three things as I finish. He's saying three things here. Verse 11, eternal life is a reality. God has given us eternal life. He has done so. Uh, I I was watching Laura Kunzberg this morning and um, the Ukraine war, the Gaza situation, uh, obviously being discussed, the the, the contemporaneous issues. And we are seeing awful things happening in our world, aren't we? And and lots of people dying. Death is, 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 is terrible. But actually it's possible to live forever. It's possible to live forever. Why? Because God has given eternal life. Now, it's up to you whether you choose it. But God has given eternal life. Number two, verse 12, eternal life is a present reality. Now, I I, I know that one day I'll be in heaven, but my eternal life has begun right now. It, It began back in 1982 when I became a Christian. And those of you who are Christians know that. Uh, Eternal life isn't just something we think about for the future. If you're a Christian, you have eternal life right now. If you're not a Christian, you don't have eternal life, but you could have. Actually, by the end of the service, you could have eternal life. That's exactly what John is saying. He who has the Son of God has life. Present tense. Now, can I just ask for a show of hands? I hope I don't get in trouble for doing this. But if you are a true Christian, can you put your hand up, please? Now, look around you in this room. All those people have eternal life. Hands down. Now, we haven't deserved it. I haven't deserved anything. But God in his grace has given it to me. And all I've done is say, help me. Please help me. I've just asked for it. And the only thing I've brought to my salvation is the sin from which I'm saved. Nothing else. It's all of God. So we're not being smug, but we are being thankful. We have eternal life. That's what John is saying. And look at verse 13. I write these things to you so that you may know you have eternal life. I, I, I deliberately asked that show of hands because um, one, one sign that you are a Christian is, is that you know it's, it's happened. It's true. It's, it's real. Uh, I, I was on, on, uh, on Tuesday looking down into a grave and in that grave was my wife's aunt, Aunt Grace. And I was able to say, uh, in that wooden box, there's a body But actually, she's not there. She's already with Jesus. And one day her body will be raised and we'll join with her. But right now, she's with Jesus. So we're not here to talk about death. We're here to talk about life. I actually said that by the graveside. And the same is true for my mum, who died all those years ago. 
Eternal life is a reality and we can be absolutely certain. And the whole reason why John gave us this passage is so that you might know. It's, 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 it's not a wish and a prayer. It's knowing. And uh, I will sit down, but fine, let me just say, if you're not yet a Christian, by the time you leave this room and go out those doors, you can know. You can know. And all it will take is for you to repent of your sin, to recognize that Christ is the one way, and to give your life to him. And you'll walk out that door knowing. That's what this passage is all about. John. Okay. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for this remarkable passage. And even though John expresses himself in, in quite confusing terms, you have said that this testimony is true and we believe you. Help us to trust Jesus, to have that confidence, even though this week might be a tough week for some of us, to have that confidence that we have eternal life. We are on the victory side and we can celebrate life no matter what happens because Jesus has given life to us. Thank you for this time together. Bless us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.